All right, everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Eleanor Harvey. I'm the senior curator of 18th and 19th century American art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It is a pleasure to be here tonight with Mary Ann Goley um, to talk about a book that she has just written. Before we get started, though, we just want to let you know that if you've got questions tonight, we're hoping you're going to use the Q&A in order to pose your questions to Mary Ann um, during the course of the program, and we will incorporate your questions as we go along or at the very end of the program. We'd also like to let you know, yes, the Smithsonian American Art Museum and Renwick Gallery are open to the public from Wednesdays through Sundays. Um, at American Art, we're open from 1130 in the morning until 7 o'clock p.m. There will be a link in the chat feature that will take you directly to the link that will allow you to sign up for free time tickets to come in. Um, so for instance, if you had wanted to see Alexander von Humboldt and the United States, you still have a chance to see it between now and July 11th when the exhibition closes and is dispersed. So get your time tickets, come on down, come back to the museums. We're still practicing social distancing and masks. It's a good, safe experience, and we would love to have you there. So with that in mind, um, what we would like to do is get started a little bit tonight. Um, our guest tonight is Marianne Goley, who for an astonishingly amazing run at the Federal Reserve, founded and established a collection of art there at this organization. It is the subject of her book, um, Democracy's Medici, The Federal Reserve and the Art of Collecting. And I will try to hold this up so that you can sort of see it, which won't work because I'm using a virtual background. Uh, but there's one behind Mary Ann's uh, body herself. What we'd like to do today, though, is introduce you to her. Um, Mary Ann holds an undergraduate degree from our own University of Maryland in College Park. She then went on to Oberlin College and graduated from Case Western Reserve University with a master's in PhD, jointly with the Cleveland Museum of Art. She has straddled both worlds of solid academic research and curatorial expertise, and the Federal Reserve basically swept her off her feet, dragged her back down to Washington, um, offered her the opportunity to establish a program unlike any other that I can think of, and she allowed her to put her stamp on this program. Um, the book that she has written is both, in a sense, her own journey as a curator, as well as that of the Federal Reserve. And so, Marianne, my very first question for you really is, what inspired you to write this? And when did it occur to you that this is a book that needed to be written? <laughs> the second part of that question is quite interesting. Okay. <laughs> I have the answer to that one. All right. But, um, okay. This institution you're referring to is the Central Bank of the United States. Fed Reserve, that's a very uncomfortable title. But who, what is the average person's relationship or knowledge of the Central Bank of the United States? Mm -hmm. I think it's, I wanted to demystify it. I wanted to humanize it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to put a human face on the institution. And there is no other book like this about the Fed. It's not about economics. Mm -hmm. I, I surely draw the red line. This is not about economic policy. Um, it's about the rhythm of the institution and the people who make it function. And I thought the public should know. And I thought also, I think it's the greatest entity, the greatest federal agency in government. Mm -hmm. And I think if you read it, I think you that's one takeaway that you have to have. Mm -hmm. It takes the moral high ground ethically. And mm -hmm. I think that's clear. And I wanted to, so I wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. So when you think about federal entities that do art, I mean, obviously there's us at the Smithsonian, there's the National Gallery. I can't think of another agency within the federal government that focuses a program on the fine arts other than the Federal Reserve. Am I right about that? Well, you know, there's a group called the Federal Buildings Curators, but they each kind of have a different approach to things. The Supreme mm -hmm. Court's collection, 
mm. you know, objects as well as portraiture. And, mm -hmm. But all of them, the mission relates to the purpose of the institution. Mm -hmm. That is not true in terms of the Fed. That is the difference. And the Federal Reserve does not collect banking art. That never was the mission. So in that regard, it is different. It's art for art's sake. All right, so for those in our audience who have not had the pleasure of reading your book yet, how would you characterize the mission of the Federal Reserve and what you felt was your mission as its founding director? Oh, <laughs> well, the mission of the Federal Reserve is monetary, monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So, so what does that have to do with art? Has nothing to do with art. All right. And and that would, and I would plainly say that uh -huh. to potential donors. But then I would say, don't you think it's fabulous that your central bank values the fine arts? Think about that. The, mm -hmm. the Fed has the highest number of PhDs in any government agency. Wow. For them to appreciate the fine arts is pretty incredible, mm -hmm. I think. Absolutely. I was intrigued at the idea of how this program got founded. I mean, I will admit to you that I cut my political teeth on Watergate. That was the moment that I stopped reading just the sports and the style section and the comics and started reading the front page. Um, when the Saturday Night Massacre rolled out, it took me three days to realize nobody actually died. So, you know, that's where I was as a kid um, when that happened. And yet it was Nancy Hanks leaning on Richard Nixon yes. that caused this program to come into focus. Uh, tell me about that. And it's also interesting that it is now, that was 19, that memorandum that she drafted for uh -huh and to send to cabinet officers was 1971. Wow. The Fed is the only agency for which is still implementing that memorandum. And you That's have, amazing. You have to give credit to Nancy Hanks. And I mm -hmm. think somebody is writing a biography on her. First of all, she had Nixon's ear. That's very important. Mm -hmm. She saw, okay, she did the NE, NEA. That's giving, giving grants to nonprofit museums, nonprofit mm -hmm. institutions. But then she says, no, oh, wait a minute, there is, there is an audience. It's a cap captive audience mm -hmm. in federal agencies. Why don't we give them, and th this was a memorandum of understanding. Mm -hmm. So it's that it went to all the cabinet officers. Burns was chairman, who's mm -hmm. not a cabinet officer, but they sent it to the Fed also. And it, it tells the agency, it doesn't, most importantly, it does not support the agency expending funds. It says, look within your institution. What do you have there that you can use to aid and support the arts? Wow. Now the Fed had its own design staff and a printing press, and I don't mean money. We print, <laughs> Eleanor, as, as you know, we printed booklets for the yeah. exhibitions. And right. They were designed by staff. So that the mem memorandum says, support the arts in any way that you can within your agency, within your capabilities. And that's, that's brilliant. That's really brilliant. And it's a shame that it's not more pervasive to this day. It is really interesting because I, you know, I think about the founding of, you know, our museum, which kind of goes all the way back to the when works of art were gifted to the president or to cabinet members at the founding of the institution, we did not know what to do with them. So, you know, John Vernon basically warehoused them. And then it was like, we're sort of waiting for a Smithsonian to like park them in. But this idea that the arts mattered as a diplomatic gesture goes all the way back to the founding of the country. And yet you actually developed a program that incorporated that diplomatic mission in providing ways domestically and internationally of doing projects with embassies and with banks so that there was this notion that the arts were part of what made those negotiations. The diplomatic aspect of it came, evolved. Okay. It came, it, came, it was an evolution of that. Actually, mm -hmm. Bill Miller, who was yeah. chairman for what, 18 months or so, if he had stayed, 
Mm -hmm. That would have happened sooner. Yeah. Yeah. When I did, when I did the 1982 Hague School exhibit, mm -hmm. that wasn't, that was a one off. That was not, that was not a new, um, that caused the whole evolution of collaborations with mm -hmm. foreign banks. Well, it's sort of nothing succeeds like success. And if you do something and it works, it's easier to get a green light for the second one. And then you expand into the third one and you just keep kind of ramping up until something basically calls a halt to that trajectory. I wanna to get to William Miller in a minute because there's, there's some interesting stuff there that you had mentioned in your book that I ended up following up on that I wanna ask you about. But I wanna you know, finish up with Watergate and set it to the side. Um, you mentioned, and I did not remember this, that the plumbers who broke into the Watergate were yes. using fake Federal Reserve IDs? Yes, because, because we had staff in the Watergate. Oh my God, I did not know I, I that. We had offices there. I did not know that. Holy smokes. <laughs> yes. And, okay, so the Fed staffers, yeah. the bunch of guys, mostly guys of the economists, mm -hmm. they taped the doors. Right. I this, remember reading that. It was before, you know, security was, you know, the, the elephant in the room that it is today. Yeah. But, you know, it was much easier. Hey, we don't have to, let's not have to swat the ID badges and mm -hmm. keys. They taped the doors. They did. And then there was the police officers at the Howard Johnson's across the street seeing the flashlights yes. in these darkened offices going, what's up with that? And decided to go over and check it out. And when they saw the tape on the locks, they knew, you know what? Something isn't right here. Yes. It's just, it's fabulous that way. But I did not know that the Federal Reserve actually inadvertently played a role um, in all of that. I'm sorry, I found that kind of charming. Um, I it, don't think it's well known. No, I don't think it is either. I mean, I consider myself a fairly good student of that. And I, that one, I just sort of sat there and looked at it and went, I did not know that. That is pretty cool. That is really cool. So I do have a question for you. One of the things that really struck me about your book from start to finish is you have a very fluid and confident grasp of finance and federal policy and what this agency does. And I'm the first one to tell you that I am ridiculously bad at math. I have everyone double check my budgets. I can't add up columns of Girl Scout cookies without getting a different answer every time. So my question to you is when you got this job, did you already have an interest in finance or an aptitude for math? Was this something you learned as kind of survival level camouflage? I didn't, I didn't, or, I didn't apply math in my job. No, but you, the way you describe it in the book, oh. you are clearly not a neophyte when it comes to understanding the core work of your agency. So my I, question for you I, is, what kind of research project was this for you? I hardly knew what the Fed was about when I joined. Okay. No, but um, well, I, I'm not sure. I'm frankly I'm not sure what you're getting after, but um, I'll tell you what I'm getting know, after. The, what yeah. I'm getting after is your description of federal policy, the role of the chairman, the way that the meetings were done is done with such grace and fluidity that it seems that it's something you had kind of absorbed as part of your appreciation and admiration for the Federal Reserve. And I'm just wondering, was it osmosis? Did you have mentors? Did you have to study this? How is it that you came to understand the workings of the Fed as, as thoroughly as you did? Well, thank you. That, I take that as a compliment. Um, I would have to say, let me just say, I mentioned Lucille Tut in there, and mm -hmm. probably one person on the Zoom session knows who she is. But she was a governor's secretary, mm -hmm. and he resigned, and so they gave her to me. So she clearly introduced me to mm -hmm. protocols, if you will. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows their place. 
It is a pyramidal, pyramid-shaped organization, and everybody has its place. Mm -hmm. And if you don't figure it out quick, yeah. you're going to get in trouble. And um, I, I think I would have to say Lucille helped me a great deal. But mm -hmm. when I started, it was the chairman's program. Mm -hmm. So people did what I asked. They paid attention wow. to the needs of the program. But you also know that you have to know your place. Mm -hmm. And after all, it's not the core function of the institution. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, I told you I was going to ask you this, and I think I know the answer to it, but I do want to know that based on the extraordinary tenure that you have there, do you have a favorite commissioner, a favorite head of the Federal Reserve, someone that you would have liked to have worked with for either the entirety of your career or you, you thought really did, understood what it was you were out to do? Oh, goodness. Yes, you did forewarn me about that. I did. And... I, I think the only way I can answer it is the individual characteristics of each chairman. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's like your children. You're not going to pick one child over another. You are very. I, I think in writing the book, the book, in retrospect, what is astounding to me is how much Volcker paid attention to my particularly fundraising efforts. And, well, and not just fundraising, but wanting to uh, entice patrons mm -hmm. like Jane Engelhard, who was clearly right. off limits. Mm -hmm. um, and he had to make sure I knew that. Um, I, I really am amazed at his attention to the program. It didn't seem like it when I was there as much as it did in writing okay. about it. Okay. You know, Greenspan to me is just a phenomenon and phenomenal. His, I describe it as his ability to read between the lines in computers. He's just, mm -hmm. he's just phenomenal. And he, and I write about this in the book, mm -hmm. he clearly understood the transformative nature of broad access to computers. He yes. understood that yes. very well. It's hard to believe how much that has changed since our careers started. You know, I don't know about you. I remember the first time I unboxed the PC in my apartment and I was in grad school yeah. um, and how transformative it was to understand that you weren't doing a Selectric Smith Corona typewriter with its, you know, correction cartridge. Um, I mean, what we've been through over the last 30 plus years has really been a huge sea change. And to have had the perspicacity to understand the power of computing and personal computing as early as he did really was something. So a point here. Yeah. Um, there were people who were in the business of forecasting what the Federal Open Market Committee, mm -hmm. their actions, they were in the business that got paid to forecast that. Mm -hmm. What is transformative about computers is the immediate access to information. Yes. And what Greenspan did in recognizing that was to seize control for the Fed to seize control of the information after an FOMC meeting. Mm -hmm. We will talk about it. And with only, I guess, towards the middle of the term of Greenspan's tenure, that we start making announcements after FOMC minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And it, it, so it was, it's a really access to information, the immediacy of it from computers was also transformative for the Fed as an institution. And you know, what comes across in your book is that sort of insight into, you know, you had a catbird seat for watching at a particular transformational moment across a number of chairmen. I have to say that of all of the chairmen you write about, the one I want to know more about is Chairman Miller. And I want to know how he got interested in the African-American artist Edward Mitchell Bannister so early that he gifted, what was it, 14 paintings 
to what was then the Frederick Douglass House and the Museum of African Art. And then when they split African art and the diaspora, those paintings came to the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I am preparing to reinstall a number of those works. And I read your book and I went scrambling back to our credit lines and I realized without him, Bannister does not exist in the Smithsonian American I Art Museum. Answer. What can you tell me about that? I can't answer. He was chairman of Textron. Wow. It, it's um, just when and um, I mean, that was early for that kind of talking, stuff. We're talking late 60s, mid yeah. late 60s. Yeah. And the paintings that let, let's put it and I'll put it this way, Eleanor. The paint, some of those paintings you have in your museum, they should be at the Fed. <laughs> You know what, we can have this conversation about, I, I did notice that American art plays this kind of sympathetic antagonist role about, you know, how we help and then we don't and how we facilitate research, but then we're also competing no, with you. It's just chance. That's just I know, chance. I know. But it, you know, it, yes, it would be nice if they were at the Fed, but you can go find your own. Um, Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> or Stephen can go find his own now that the, now that it, it's not your uh, your uh, your burden to bear on that. But I did. I, it was interesting because one of the things that I took away from your book was how deeply intertwined all of our histories are. Isn't it? You know, you think of New York as having this deeply contextualized and intertwined art scene between the Met and MoMA and the Whitney and all of the others. And what you did was you surfaced the connections between the Fed, American Art, the National Gallery, the Phillips Collection, in a way that I had not been paying attention to. And you know, you had mentioned, and I, I think it came through in your book, how instrumental Carter Brown's influence was in being able to launch and support the program that you developed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well right from the beginning before I existed. So let's give credit to the Fed staff. Mm -hmm. When I took that job, I was handed a four part program. Yeah. Exhibitions, collect, mm -hmm. sculpture program, employee exhibits. Wow. This was already determined. Not only that, and this is what to this day, I don't have, I am amazed they'd signed a contract for an exhibition. I was not, yes. I was not hired yet. I, yeah. I'm going, who, who, what museum would have agreed to that where the institution didn't have a curator yet? Although that kind of spoke to the fact that you always sort of felt like the Fed didn't quite understand what it was that a curator did and why you needed the budget that you did, the technical expertise in your art handlers. Let's twist that around. How okay. I get a miracle with the budget that I had. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> if, yeah, let's face it, the budget that you had would barely hire a curatorial assistant today, but much like, less actually allow you to do we anything. Can't, we can't compare it to today's. That's true. You know, back in its time, but still the case, you've made the case. Yeah, yeah. And I think you make the case in your book as well. I mean, for anybody considering a career in the fine arts who gets an unorthodox offer from a, an entity that doesn't seem to be center of the note, I think that the takeaway from your story is if you have resilience, grit, determination, and savvy, you can figure out how to carve it out and work the system while both knowing your place and telling people what your place is. But it's also the institution. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the Steichen exhibition, yeah. the collector in Norway mm -hmm. paid for the shipment. Wow. The contemporary of uh, the Hungarian exhibition, Jill Witsey mm -hmm. from Denver, they paid for the transportation. It's because the Fed was asking. Yeah. Not yeah. Me, the Fed was asking. Yeah. That did have, and of course, they did not present a conflict of interest. You make a really good point about that, that, you know, those of us on, you know, whether we work for. Why? Yeah, whether we work for a federal museum or whether we work for um, a private museum or a civic museum, we all learn that there are lines you don't cross and there are conflicts that exist. But you had a particularly high bar 
um, that the rest of us don't. And I wonder, for the, again, for the sake of those people who haven't had the pleasure of reading your book yet, kind of set the context for us about the limitations within which you had to get creative in order to build this program. Well, <clears throat> in terms of fundraising, building a donor base, mm -hmm. the rule of a success in fundraising is your constituency. You mm -hmm. go to your constituency. I could not. Right. My constituency was off limits. Um, wow. It wasn't interesting enough though collecting was one of the four points of my program and being hired, mm -hmm. they had not written the disclosure statement yet. And it was not until the first gift came from Buddy Mayer. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, things evolved and I would bring yeah. things to their attention. Mm -hmm. I brought it to their attention, not the other way around. Right. I brought many things to their attention when I, wanted to make sure I wasn't crossing the ethical mm -hmm. red line. Mm -hmm. And um, so if it was unclear whether a person had um, a conflict of interest, I had a piece of paper, I could give them and ask them to sign it. Mm -hmm. But I really preferred to settle it in a conversation before we got to that. Yeah. No, I thought it was more genteel, if you will. More of well, genteel. you and I shared a rapport with a, a collector that we are both particularly fond of, and I think we both miss a great deal, and that's Graham Williford. Yes. Um, for, for, I, miss, I miss his accent. I miss everything about him. I miss the cackling <laughs> laughter. I miss the great restaurants. I miss the elusive behavior, the crazy apartment on the Upper West Side that you described so beautifully with the metal racks and paintings eight deep where you'd hold something up and put it back yeah, down I again. To, I went to the East 10th Street apartment as well, where so, paintings were in the doorway. So how did you meet him? Well, um, my introduction to him was in how? graduate school with John White Alexander. Is that how it worked? Yeah, now, that's where it started. Okay. So we're talking 72. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, for, for the sake of all of you, Graham Williford, the, the greatest yeah. sense of loss in my professional career was that when I was at the Dallas Museum of Art, we were jockeying to get things on loan that Marianne wanted at the Federal Reserve. And there were things that I really wanted down in Dallas. And in fact, our stories dovetail because we had actually talked to Graham about the fact that his unorthodox collecting was exactly what set him apart and made him worthy of remembrance. Um, he was collecting against the market. He was a- and I mean, for, for our audience, American, American and, collector. Yes. Um, and what's interesting is we had actually talked to him about gifting 50 major things to Dallas. Ron Pisano was going to write his life story and really put him in the context of the other collectors of the era, Henry Fuller, Jimmy Rico, you know, all of the people that he would tell stories about who were sort of an undercurrent that still needs to be explored as a, a kind of a golden age of collecting American art before it became trendy and really expensive. But what was neat about Graham was that he collected what he loved, he cared about knowing what he had, he was fierce about his belief that he knew more about it than either you or I did. Um, and, he and, did. <laughs> and he did, yeah. He was a master at sleuthing out the descendants of artists to go find things. He would show up in Dallas and unpack something in the galleries and the guard would nearly have a heart attack. And I'd get a phone call saying, there's this man in the galleries unpacking a painting. What do you want me to do? And I said, don't let him leave. Um, <laughs> And we would end up going out to dinner and it was his way of announcing his arrival because he wouldn't give you any advance notice that he was actually showing up. Um, but I met him through another person you did a show for and that was Jay Phelan, um, who I believe is the collector you refer to in Chevy Chase. Yes. Um, whose collection of Western art that you ended up profiling. And watching Jay with his gravelly voice straight man to Graham Williford's 
you know, cackling laughter, listening to the two of them tell stories is probably one of the highlights of my career, just because it's a reminder that it's the people who love the art who make the whole thing really seem like a, this fabulous opportunity to, to have a window into something that otherwise we just miss altogether just in scholarship. But we, in our curatorial role, learned a great deal from them and the works, they, the works they collected. Absolutely, we did. Yeah. Absolutely, we did. You did a lot of work, not just for the home-based Federal Reserve, but you also did amazing work helping the regional feds build their collections. You talk about Atlanta, you talk about Jacksonville. I want to focus on Dallas because again, I spent 10 years in Dallas and so I know your cast of characters. I recognize the names of the people that you were talking about. <laughs> and I'm still amused that Vernon Fisher blew it by asking you to accept two things instead of just one thing. And so it didn't happen at all because his work is really wonderful. But for the purpose of this audience, I was like, he was greedy. Yes, was greedy. but it was a shame because he's really good. But yes, he the was money, so the money tree that I yes. describe in the book. Yeah. And a fantastic piece. Yeah. And the bank went so far as to say, so it was um, cast tree in metal, of course. Mm -hmm. And, but within the limbs, the tree limbs would be set little cameras. And the cameras would be focused on the money vaults. Yes. And the bank said, well, okay, that could be okay as long as we don't give a viewer context. You can't see where pathways go or mm -hmm. where they intersect or anything like that. That was brilliant. And, yeah. and but you uh. like Part, you like the part about Henry Cisneros? Yes, I did. I really did. But again, you know, it's what I do want to do for the purpose of our audience tonight, and I'm going to pivot this a little bit, is what is so Texas about the whole thing is the letter that um, was sent to... McTeer. Sorry? McTeer. The, yeah, the, the letter that was sent from McTeer, because this is classic Texas at a time when I was learning what it meant to be a classic Texan. <laughs> Dear Dave, you probably already know it, but I want to make sure you are fully aware of the work that Marianne Goley has done for the art program at the Dallas Fed. First, she did an excellent job working with our art committee in establishing our program, identifying the appropriate local artists for us, and selecting the pieces. We've had nothing but praise for the results. She did this effectively without allowing any food fights to break out among all those sensitive creative types with strongly held opinions. This phase was over some time ago and we were about to allow a quarter of our art budget to go unspent when Mary Ann discovered a great sculpture for our lobby that had heretofore been unavailable, the Sod Buster by Luis Jimenez. And if you don't know that piece, go Google it after this program is over. She not only negotiated the purchase for us, she lit a fire under us to make other good acquisitions and negotiated an average 20% savings on all of it for us. It's not just that Marianne worked hard and effectively on our behalf. She did so in an area where I am totally unqualified. She brought good taste and art to us Philistines, which we appreciate very much. Thanks for allowing her to help us out. And that's what I love about working. Why is that so Texan? It's just so Texan about being able to admit I'm a Philistine. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. She did a really good job. No food fights. She did this great stuff. There's no jargon. There's no pretense. It's all just kind of like, hey, without her, we'd have made a bloody hash of it. Thanks very much. <laughs> that's what's pure Texas is that notion that I'm good at what I do. She's really good at what she does. This was awesome. That's the kind of letter you want in your file ultimately at the end of the day. To me, that means more than a lot of the other stuff. I just read that and I immediately understood that there are a bunch of people going, what the hell are we doing here? And it's like, what the hell? She's doing this really great stuff. This is awesome. Well, I, I'm sorry, but I was the girl from the East Coast and everybody else on the committee was from Texas. 
and I truly felt like the outsider. But you know, the great thing about Texas is that if you're good at what you do, their attitude is, well, you had a good education. What do you plan to do with it? Show us something. Okay. You know, tell us why you're here. And they clearly enjoyed that. So we have a question from Lewis Koch who says, hi, good to see you after so many years. Let's talk a little bit about some of the artwork you actually collected for the Fed. The book goes into a lot of three-dimensional chess about how you did it. But since you weren't allowed to actually like have 30 color reproductions in the middle of it, which has got to be killing you as well as me, what would you have illustrated? Well, there are some, there are things in the book that I wish were illustrated in color, but the, oh, bo yeah. the Bolotowski is fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. In the- uh, That's the, the double spirit, diamond? Yes, in the yeah. spirit of Mondrian, Mm -hmm. but what did he do? Where are the two points meet? Where yeah. did the two points meet? So what are you most proud of in terms of acquisitions for the Fed? I mean, yes, you illustrated a couple of them in black and white, but talk so to me. There are a couple of things. I, I think the Jeanne Elion is superb. Mm -hmm. It was actually painted in Virginia. Was it really? Yes, wow. because he was married to um, um, Louis Blair's mother. Any of that, it, it was painted in Virginia and it signs as such on the back. The William Truss Richards, which I talk about in the book, mm -hmm. that is historically significant because, mm -hmm. you know, the Met owns Richards coupons. Yes. Richards would do yeah. coupons for his clients, the Whitney's. Mm -hmm. And this is the only one where the coupon and the gouache exist. You see the idea, you see the finished piece. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very, very proud of that piece. I, I'm, I'm still to this day proud of negotiating with Bob Sholkoff mm -hmm. for the Louis Emmy. He wanted 10, I countered with 6,500. You know, you put these prices in the context of the day, you know. But yeah. your ability to negotiate those prices, your ability to come back and say, no, I'm not going to pay you $250,000 for this, but I will pay you one hundred and fifty dollars for it. And yet you had the credibility to be able to actually pull off some pretty amazing deals. You, you don't counter? Don't Absolutely you? you counter. It's just a matter that, as you and I both know, they don't teach you that in grad school. You either have an aptitude for it or you don't. Yeah. You so either learn it or you don't. Um, Here's the key to that, that success mm -hmm. is again, I mentioned earlier, who's asking? Yeah. Who's the institution? Yeah. And, and I mentioned this in the book, we pay in 30 days. That's true and we don't. <laughs> yes, exactly. We so don't. what's the expression bird in hand? Yep. Would you rather give a 20% discount and have the money in 30 days or a 10% discount and get the money in a year. Maybe Which, you should be teaching the rest of us how to pay in 30 days. And I return to the institution. Yeah. Yes, the institution yeah. pays in 30 days. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. So you mentioned something. It's another thing I told you I was going to ask you this. You mentioned that the Fed had a baseball team. Yes. And that the chairman played baseball. Greenspan. Greenspan. What worked. position did he play? I didn't research that, Eleanor. I don't okay. Know. But do you remember the position you played on that team? Uh, yes, of course. Catcher. You were catch. You know, it takes a certain amount of savvy to actually play catcher on a baseball team. I was the pitcher for I the baseball team in position. grad school. I was at some position. I was told to be catcher. <laughs> I, I nobody else wants to be. Marianne, you are too tall to be the catcher. <laughs> okay. It's Whatever. short people who play catcher. I don't understand I, how that happened. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but it livened things up. It seemed to go along with your maxim, which is are you having a good time? <laughs> Yes. And I think that too many people don't ask that question often enough in their careers. 
they kind of think that if they actually have to answer that question, maybe they're going to be scared of the answer. But I think one of the things I loved about posing that question of you have everything to lose if you don't ask, and are you having a good time? And so one of my questions is, yeah, I mean, in a 31 year career, you're going to have ups and downs, you're going to have tense moments and triumphs, you're going to have frustrating things and epiphanies. Did you have a good time? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't have written the book. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there are some people who write books specifically because they did not have a good time. So, but to be honest, I think that, yeah, you did, but I'm curious to know. Well, I, think the, I think the answer is this. I think what I accomplished was extraordinary. Yeah. I think Put it another way, I think I added value to the institution. Mm -hmm. I think I strengthened relation, I know I strengthened relationships between central banks and the board. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah, totally. And that's the kind of thing that is durable and lasts beyond any one person's tenure. If you had to think about it, what was the most unexpected gift that you got for the Fed? Oh, it, it clearly has to be when Rockefeller sent the Frankenthaler. Okay. That's at the beginning of the program. He just, he had lunch with Chairman Burns and he says, I'm going to send you something. Duh. Wow. <laughs> Helen Frankenthaler painting. <clears throat> yes. That's pretty amazing. Um, so I've got another question for you, which is one of the parts of your job was to make sure that there was art in people's offices. And yeah. you were particularly egalitarian about making sure that it wasn't just for the higher level senior people, it was really across the board. But there's one thing you don't talk about in your book, which is what was in your office? Gosh, nothing. What? What? Nothing, actually. Nothing. Bookshelves, bookshelves. Yeah. Windows. I had a window office, so that takes away actually nothing, Eleanor. Seriously. Seriously. I hate to say it. I hate to disappoint you. No, it's not a disappointment. I mean, we can't have art in our offices because we're in a Leeds building, which means they turn off the air conditioning over the weekend, so we can't do stuff like that. But um, I was just curious because the pride you clearly took in positioning works of art so that the employees at the Fed felt good about their offices and about their workspace, the fact that you really sort of thought through how to make this a collegial, pleasant place in which to do your work, I wondered whether or not you expended all of your energy on those offices and the atrium and the exhibition spaces and the sculpture area outdoors, even if people did think that there were resting things out there that you should be moving. Um, I just wondered if there was anything left over for you so that you couldn't wait to actually put something up in your walls. I hate to disappoint you. I I'm had not sure it's a disappointment. I, I just find it really and interesting. I had windows and I had shelves that that consumed the wall. Wow. But in terms of this egalitarian approach, mm -hmm. um, let's, let's pick that expression, supply and demand. OK. What was my supply? This is an evolutionary process. I could not do that at the beginning. That only emerged over time when we had more works. Mm -hmm. We just didn't, we didn't have the supply. Yeah. 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 So one of the things that I admire about what you did at the Fed was that in the midst of those four core elements for your job, you know, you're collecting, you are exhibiting, you're on this diplomatic mission that was kind of, you know, generated itself out of all of this. You're paying attention to internal politics. You're betting against the market. I thought that was a really important point that in order to maximize and leverage the amount of money that you had, you had to cut across the market, which I think is one of the things Graham Williford admired about you was that he's not looking for things that are at the top of the market. He's deliberately looking for how to maximize what he gets for the dollars that he has. Um, 
but I think in all of that, um, one of the things that I really appreciated about what you did is you maintained your scholarship. You, you pulled together, I mean, you've got books on Steich and you've got a book on John White Alexander. You've got things that didn't manifest themselves just within the walls of the Federal Reserve, but you still found time to do the serious scholarly research that so many curators find so hard to balance against the day-to-day, -day, particularly in a federal institution, whereas we all know that if you eat red tape for breakfast, you will have indigestion at lunchtime. So the idea is how do you avoid the red tape and still get your job done? And I'm just curious to know whether or not this was a 24 seven, you live, eat, breathe art history or whether there was an accommodation or whether the Fed really understood that in order to be a whole person and a whole scholar, that this was also important to your workload to be able to do those big books on Steichen and uh, the others. How do you balance it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Eleanor, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do it by peeling away. Um, I had dinner at a regular time every night. I did not skip meals. I did sleep well. <laughs> I didn't lose sleep over projects. Once, uh, one, you know, from time to time, maybe, but not on a regular basis, because as you well know, I can't do that. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it, it could be stressful at times, but you know, there's good stress and there's bad stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the the Hague School exhibition was uh, an extraordinary accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Some of these things you say these things, but you have to put them in the context. That was 1982 when Charlie Moffat could not raise the funds to bring the Hague School exhibition from the Royal Academy to the Met. Wow. He couldn't get the money. I did the first show on the influence of, of Velasquez on American painters. Yes. I mean, the, since then, I mean, the Chrysler has just closed a show about the Spanish influence on American painters. Right. So, right. you know, I, Charles Rennie McIntosh, let me mention this. Yeah. That was the most popular exhibition at the Fed ever. And the reason I know is because I've referred to our little booklets before, they disappeared. Wow. We, we couldn't keep the supply. We started Xeroxing them wow. because the public, the AIA people, the architects were all coming. That's amazing. That show. That's was amazing. the most popular show. And the first time that Macintosh was ever shown in this country. Which just blew my mind when I read that. I have to admit, I Googled it just to kind of go, how could that possibly be true? But you know, what your career has basically said is you punched way above your weight class, your entire career at the Fed. Nobody probably when they hired you expected you to have both the ambition and the skills to pull off projects like that, that would make any mainstream art museum curator weep with joy to have on their resume. And that's, I think, one of the things I took away from this book, which is, I mean, I went to a number of your exhibitions, both before and after 9-11, and I've been through the whole security hoops and trying to get into the building and all of the rest of that. And I remember you and me talking about your sort of despair that you were putting all this effort into doing these shows and then you had to jump through so many hoops before someone could actually come see the show. And I think this gets down to the, if a tree falls in the forest and it doesn't make a sound, does it really matter? And I think the point that your career really points out is, yes, it does. It matters that it gets done. It matters to the people who are directly involved in the, the, in the events that take place. The, the, what the pandemic has proven to us is the number of people who walk through your door is immaterial compared to the friendships and relationships you forge, the ideas that you support, the, the way that you get the word out, that ultimately that's what matters and that you have footprints, you have you know periodicals, you have relationships. It's about content. It's yeah. about content. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, I'm assuming Bob Goley is a relative of yours who actually made a lovely observation in the Q&A. In spirit- He's my brother. Well, that's kind of what I figured. In spirit, <laughs> didn't you have every work of art in your office? Oh, sure. I thought that was, I, I, I said, that was, that was well put. Yeah, yeah. That was well put. Um, because yeah, I mean, I remember when you had Graham Williford's um, collection up on the walls and you and I walked through that and it was every time we stopped in front of a painting, you would wax eloquent about why you chose it and why it mattered. And it was like they were all going to be friends for life. And I think for a lot of people in curatorial, that's the thing that motivates us is we love the art. We admire the people who also admire it. But ultimately what we want is that relationship. Our lives are enriched by our access to these artworks and the way that it expands our sense of what matters in the world. And I think every conversation you and I have ever had kind of plays with that idea of this is why this matters. This is really wonderful. There, there's this shared moment among curators where you go, have you seen this? Isn't this really cool? And you realize that the it, it's like dropping a, a rock into the pond and the ripples just keep going. Art is essential to yeah. the quality of life. Well, and, and you made that abundantly clear. I wonder how many employees at the Fed never really thought about that until they encountered you and the program. Oh, I think a lot. <laughs> and you know, I, it's, it still continues just today, totally, totally off the wall. Yeah. Someone I'm emailing about Carol Sockwell. She's doing mm -hmm. the Sockwell catalog resume. I just, I just reached out to a Fed retiree and said, Greg, don't you have some Sockwells? Really? And put the two of them together. Yeah. Fed retiree. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the relationships that we develop along the way, I think that's the other thing is that, you know, artworks are, they have tentacles and they connect us all. Um, it isn't, you know, every time you borrow something, you, you forge a connection with it. And it's like, you know, it's creating a friend group that expands beyond anything that we could have hoped for otherwise. Um, so I know the program continues. I know Stephen Phillips took over for you when you stepped away. Was it, it's got to be on the one hand, 31 years is a respectable long career and it looks like you've been every bit as busy and energized in retirement. I'm not even gonna call it retirement. You haven't retired. You come to every lunch bag we ever you know, post. It's like you're, you're still there. But what I love is that you transitioned so gracefully from working full-time for the Fed to kind of working full-time for you. And so I guess one question you is- about, You forgot about the eight months where I broke my leg. No, I did not forget about the eight months. I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you did, yes, you have also had some setbacks that have meant that you haven't been as active, maybe, and you're not playing baseball maybe as much as you used to. Um, but I am curious. I know the John White Alexander Project. I mean, you really ran with that after you retired. You're still working on it because catalogs resume are endless. But my sense is, what is it that gets you up in the morning and what is it that motivates your days as you think back on your career, but then look forward to what else consumes you? Well, you know, much of this is our profession is about relationships mm -hmm. and it is the catalog resume. Mm -hmm. I knew John White Alexander's granddaughter. And when I was a graduate student, she Xeroxed the news clippings for the 1890s and sent them to me. You know, as a graduate student, you know, we're always short on money. And she did things like that. And I'm very close with her great granddaughters. And mm -hmm. I feel I, I have information. I saw the estate in 1972, 73, mm -hmm. took notes. I have information that nobody else has. 
I'm obligated to get that out there. Yeah. And I think it's that combination of inspiration and obligation that are sort of the load, the, the guide stars for so many curatorial careers. We feel an obligation to the artists and to the people who've put their faith in us. When they give us access to those materials, they are looking for us to do something worthwhile with it. And whether we do it inside an institution or outside of an institution, that really matters. Um, and I think it's why so many of us chose a career that rather than grading papers um, and teaching the next generation in a classroom, what we are doing is we are stewarding the legacies of artists, some of whom have made their reputations indelible and others who need to be made indelible so we don't lose track of them. Um, and one of the things I appreciate about the way that you cut across the grain in building the Feds collection is in precisely focusing on a number of those artists who most needed that extra boost in order for their careers to matter and how the market has actually reaffirmed your judgment in so many different ways. Yes. Um, and isn't that ultimately what we feel good about as curators, which is where did the ones that get away go? And did the artists we championed when everyone else looked at us like we were crazy, did it actually all end up panning out? Did the eye actually hold us up in good stead? And were we in fact right to stick to our guns? Um, Marianne, you've done an amazing job of, I think, giving us a window into your career, the Federal Reserve's collection, and really what it means to be a curator, regardless of what kind of institution you find yourself in. And in this day and age, coming out of a pandemic where the job market is crazy, the takeaway I took was if someone offers you a job out of left field for an institution that you're not really sure is exactly what you want to do, maybe the job then becomes what you make of it as much as what they might envision it to be. And that that's inner resilience, the ability to see potential in something that others might see as one dimensional or a, a sidestep. Um, and I came away from Democracy's Medici really sort of thinking that had I been put in the same position you were, would I have had the perspicacity to take the job? Would I have had the imagination to do with it what you did? Um, and I think that this book is a wonderful opportunity to look at those um, works and to really understand how the pieces fit together and how the Fed collection is as much um, a way of thinking about your career and your values as it is about those of the Fed. So I would suggest to everybody, the book's right behind Marianne. You can see it right there. There's the cute little thing. I'm going to hold it up in front of my face so that maybe it will show up. This is the problem with virtual backgrounds, people. It doesn't work that way. You hold it up, Marianne. Can I explain the cover? Yeah, please explain the cover. OK, it's an eagle, right? Yes. But it's made of shredded currency. Nice. Yeah. Nice, nice. We but have the link in. Is the artist, and we gave him the shredded currency. That's pretty awesome. And I, I think it's the perfect, a perfect image for the book. That is fantastic. Um, Marianne, I, I can't tell you how much fun this has been. I cannot wait until we can do lunch bags again in person. Um, I think we're overdue for some kind of a, just a social lunch to catch up on all of this. We have put um, the link to purchase Marianne's book in the chat. Please do yourself a favor and go take a look at it. Please come see the exhibitions at American Art and the Renwick. The other Smithsonian museums are also open. It's not like I'm dinging them, but you know, hey, um, you're here, which means you've got a vested interest in our program and keep up with what's going on at the Fed. Let's give Stephen Phillips a little bit of love for a program that he inherited and has very, very big shoes to fill. Thank you, Eleanor. 
Well, look, thank you, Mary Ann. This has been an awesome opportunity. I've had a really wonderful time. The comments in the Q&A have been gratifying. You've got friends here from all over, Helen Nicholson, um, your brother, um, Lewis Koch. Um, it's just been really nice to, uh, to be able to see so many people who uh, have a vested interest in connecting, even if it is via Zoom, so that we can all stay in touch. All right, and with that, we're going to release you all to your evenings. Thank you ever so much for coming. Please remember the art museums, um, they basically exist on both the strength of the people like Marianne working inside them, as well as people like you who help us in so many different ways um, remain vibrant. Your contributions, your showing up, um, your being here as part of these Zooms really matters to us because this is the way we help understand the footprint that we leave and the fact that we believe that art is essential to living a good life and feeling like the world is a place worth living in. So um, as you feel comfortable getting out into the world, please do so. We look forward to seeing you um, at our programs again, but thank you so much for spending this time with us tonight.